What's going on, everybody? Welcome to this week's Lumix Live. Uh, pro sorry if the energy's a little bit lower today. Um, I literally just got back about two hours ago from NAB out in Las Vegas. So, uh, as the title says, we're going to be uh, talking about what we were showing off, how we had some really cool kind of combinations on the cameras with some accessory partners uh, and just, you know, kind of recapping what was uh, going on at the show and also covering some of the news that came out from NAB. So not necessarily Lumix related, but uh, camera industry related uh, that we thought were actually some really cool uh, innovations. So, oh man, excuse me. So uh, before we jump into that, I want to uh, remind everybody about Lumix Pro Services. We have the red and the platinum tier here in the United States. Uh, the red tier is free and available for anyone that has a uh, qualifying Lumix camera. So if you've purchased a camera recently or you own a Lumix camera, uh, make sure to go over, uh, follow the QR code or go to lumix-pro.us or take a look at the link down in the description uh, to get yourself registered over on that. Um, like I said, it's free. It gets you into the plat into the uh, system. So uh, you get yourself uh, protected in, in the event that you may need to get a camera serviced for any number of reasons. Uh, if you're someone who likes uh, much higher level protection of your equipment, uh, or you like the better peace of mind of knowing that you have a backbone of support behind your equipment, Make sure to take a look at the Lumix Pro Services Platinum Series here in the United States. Um, the Platinum Series, it is a paid level service, but that series gets you all of the existing uh, benefits that the Red Series does, so your three-year extended warranty here in the United States, uh, but expands on it with two-day repairs with free next-day shipping both ways. You get 20% off out of warranty repairs, so if you happen to drop or break a lens or a camera, stuff like that. Uh, you can get them repaired and you get to save a little bit of money there. Uh, you also get annual sensor cleanings, EVF uh, cleanings, lens calibrations, firmware updates, all the kind of servicing stuff that you would expect uh, when you're leading up into maybe a new season of shooting. Uh, you also have uh, access to our main um, uh, hotline if you're in the Platinum Series. So if you need to speak to someone for service, uh, you have the ability to reach out to us and actually get some service that way. Uh, and then last but not least, you also get a really cool Peak Design strap as a welcome gift and a thank you for joining the the uh, membership plan there. So like I said, the links uh, were up on the screen. Uh, they're also down in the description below for Lumix Pro Services in the U.S. Um, if you are joining us from outside of the United States, uh, there is the global link at the bottom there too in the description uh, that you can use to be able to find out if it's available or if, the, if an LPS service uh, program is available in your region. Uh, and yeah, we can basically go from there. Uh, let's see here. A uh, couple other housekeeping things. Um, yeah, so we are live today. Uh, we're going to run for a uh, fairly decent amount of time today. Uh, try to hit about that hour uh, time frame. We'll uh, see how long my voice lasts for this. But uh, ultimately, yeah, so we're going to be covering the NAB stuff. Um, I don't have all of my equipment back yet. It is still in transit with FedEx. Uh, but uh, I've got some websites open to show you some cool stuff there. And then, uh, yeah, if you have questions during the stream, because this is also just a general Q&A stream. If you have questions, drop them in the chat, as you can see many others are doing. 
uh, and tag at Lumix cameras uh, so that I can see it on my side and we can get to them. Uh, I think that basically covers the housekeeping aside from I want to thank uh, from the bottom of my heart everybody that swung by the booth and uh, you know just kind of chat up with Matt and uh, Neil and myself and our ambassadors Emily and Todd White. Um, it is a humbling experience to be able to actually meet with some of you in person and have these conversations face to face. Um, we were overjoyed by the support that, that y'all show us and, uh, the excitement that you had by coming over to the booth. So thank you so much from Matt, Neil, myself, Todd, and Emily for swinging by and, uh, making, uh, our first major return to trade shows such an enjoyable experience for all of us. These are a lot of work to put together and there are a lot of long days, but, uh, being able to chat with all of you is an awesome experience, uh, and not just through the chat screen here. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and with that, let's kind of jump right into this. So first off the bat, um, I want to, uh, make everybody aware, uh, some are already pointing it out in the chat. I believe who just dropped it in there. Um, FC uh, just dropped this down in the chat about a bunch of firmware updates that have just been released. Uh, so if you are on uh, a number of our Lumix cameras, we're going to share my screen here. Uh, we'll do it that way. Uh, if you are uh, an owner of cameras like the GH6, GH5S, GH5, uh, GH5 Mark II, the G9, G85s, uh, we literally just released a firmware, a set of firmware updates uh, on April 25th, uh, so a couple of days ago, uh, that fixed uh, uh, some minor bugs uh, in the GH5 Mark II. There is an image quality uh, improvement that was also done for that camera. So if you haven't already, uh, make sure to go over to the site here. Uh, I will drop this in the chat for everybody uh, so that we can, um, you know, you can get over there and take a look. Uh, but yeah, yeah. Um, Firmware updates are always coming, uh, and as you can see, in some cases, these are cameras that are either relatively a little old, um, but yeah, there there has been a recent update for some of this stuff, so we're going to drop that into the chat uh, right now, uh, and yeah, be sure to go over there and take a look, get your cameras updated. Um, obviously, uh, you can do that while watching the stream, or you can do that while after watching the stream. Uh, yeah, um, and also as a reminder too, on that page, if you own a GH6 or you're looking to get a GH6, make sure to update your lenses. Uh, there are a number of updates with the lenses that support things like either linear uh, manual focus uh, for the lenses that have the hardware capabilities for it. Uh, there are also updates in there for improving 24 frames per second autofocus uh, and, uh, also updates for the 200, 200 plus frames per second, uh, push AF functionality that the GH6 has. So if you're going to be shooting in full HD 240p, uh, and you want to actually be able to use the push AF, uh, you got to make sure you have those lenses updated so that, uh, everything communicates properly and everything's working, uh, as it should. Uh, so let's see here. Uh, let's take a look at some of the questions. Okay, so uh, what remains? One of the first questions. Uh, you know that you're going to ask about the uh, Sick AF shirt, so open up about it. Um, yeah, so that's the shirt I'm wearing. Uh, that's a shirt from the S1 uh, launch that we did. I'm actually wearing it right now. You can kind of see it. Um, yeah, it's it's a relatively old shirt. Uh, I've, I've worn this shirt for a very long time. Um, know that... Uh, as we move forward, um, and I'm going to address this right off the bat because uh, we did get a lot of questions about this at the uh, at the show. Um, we have made uh, you know the comments that we are co consistently and constantly uh, the same word um, evaluating autofocus systems. Uh, right now, we're on the DFD system, so uh, obviously that's what we're using right now. Um, everything's being evaluated, so um, keep giving us your feedback. Uh, it helps us build better products. It helps us identify uh, areas that we can improve on, areas that we can maybe innovate uh, in ways that others are not, like what we've done with the GH6. Um, so yeah, just wanted to acknowledge that I saw your comment, and uh, when I dropped that uh, memory card reader, um, I guess I made the internet go a little crazy, at least in our little world. So uh, let's see here. 
Cliff asks, uh, I think Panasonic announced RAW over HDMI for Atomos recorders. Is that in 4K RAW or 5.7K RAW uh, for the GH6 as a qualification? So um, at the launch of the GH6, we did uh, release information about the firmware update schedule. So fairly uh, common for the Lumix cameras. We wouldn't have a launch if we didn't already have future plans for what we want to do to these things. Um, the only thing that I can say and what we have uh, announced about with it uh, is the 4K 100, and, excuse me, uh, 4K 120p uh, raw data out over HDMI to the Atomos Ninja 5 Plus. Um, as we get closer to when that firmware is going to come out, there will be more information shared about it. Uh, but yeah, so the only thing we've announced so far is 4K 120 frames per second raw data video out over HDMI uh, into the Atomos Ninja 5 Plus. Uh, as well as uh, 4K 120 frames per second video output over HDMI, so using the actual 2.1 standard. Um, and then, what else did we announce? Uh, additional ProRes codecs are going to be coming in that first uh, firmware update that we've got scheduled for the camera, so you'll have DCI and Full HD ProRes internal options in HQ and uh, 422. Uh, and then probably the biggest one I know that we got a lot of questions about is the external SSD recording. So as we get closer, more information will come out about those uh, at this moment right now. That's all I can really share about the updates. Uh, let's see here. Any other quick questions before we jump in and we talk about some of the cool stuff from NAB? Um, man, what's pixel to pixel? We'll address that afterwards. Uh, S1, you want luminance spot meter. Hi, Dennis. Welcome to the stream. It's got to be late where you are, or maybe not. Maybe not too late. Um, let's go. Is there Lumix Pro service in the EU? Yes, there is. Uh, at least I'm fairly certain there is. Uh, if you go on to the global uh, link down on the bottom, uh, you can look at what countries and regions have a Lumix Pro Service uh, portal for you, and then you can check out what programs are available for them. Uh, Automant. Uh, I think it's Automant. Um, yeah, so you'll see it down in the bottom uh, description for the global page. Uh, let's see here. More info on today's new GH6 firmware, particularly on that bug fix. Uh, so the firmware update that came for the, so the GH6's firmware update came back on April 5th. Um, that firmware update was, um, it corrected a bug where there was a magenta or green cast on the screen when using live, um, live image during photo and video recording. Um, and then there was also a tweak to the electronic stabilization when you were using 5.7K or 5.8K with, uh, wide angle lenses. So that's the only update that's come on the GH6 so far. Um, the major update will come uh, at a later date, and we'll have more info there. Uh, more information there. Uh, the rest of the cameras, um, like the S5, was um, uh, correcting a bug in the save and restore camera settings uh, options there. I think that was for a number of the cameras. Uh, the GH5 Mark II uh, got a uh, correction, a little bit of an improvement to the Cinelight D photo style uh, for some color cast that was going on. So, um, yeah, we'll always add uh, updates to these cameras and, uh, yeah, um, kind of hopefully showing it. Uh, let's see here. What else we got? Uh, welcome, uh, Strons. Uh, you're welcome for the streams. I love doing them, even if I'm a little lower energy today. Uh, let's see here. Manual focus is this question. We can go from dark, sudden so spear, image blown out. Can you help alleviate that? Will you ever add, uh, JKP photo, will you ever add support for the S5 to use external SSD recording? Um, so external SSD recording, uh, requires two things, uh, at least with, uh, my understanding of it. Uh, the new Venus engine. So the totally new processor, which can handle the I.O. Uh, demands for going out over USB. And two, it needs a fast enough uh, USB-C port. Uh, on the GH6, you'll notice that the USB-C uh, interaction on the uh, GH6 is a 10 gig uh, USB-C port. Uh, so we need at least that. Um, yeah, we need just some, some uh, hardware involved with it. Uh, to my knowledge, I'm fairly certain, one, that the, well, I know for certain, 
the S5, S1, S1R, S1H, uh, every camera before the GH6 doesn't have the new processor. So uh, from a processor's perspective, uh, we may not have the, uh, the pipeline to do it, uh, but mainly there's no hardware to support it. So uh, that's going to be a GH6 and for uh, future kind of camera consideration. Uh, let's see here. Hi, Sean. Uh, Damien here. Uh, could someone from Lumix make an in-depth video explaining equivalency, especially when it comes to light, intensity and total of light, aperture, aperture diameter? Ideally, with physical demonstrations, there's so much conflicting information out on the internet. Um, yes, there is. There is a ton of conflicting information, and there's a ton of half information uh, available out there. Um, I don't think that's something we will ever dive into. Um, in some cases, you can look at a conversation, and it kind of turns into one of those... Uh, uh, controversial just topics that's going to uh never really end incredibly well um you know you start looking at the uh the conversation about say uh flip screens versus tilt screens which are better um you'll get half that want one half that want the other um but it is something that we can look at um i just don't know if it's something that we're going to be able to actually do a, an actual video on with live demonstrations um I can look into it, but like I said, I, I don't really think um, we would do it. Um, that's a little bit of a back and forth answer on it, but yeah, we can look into it. Um, I can't make promises that we would do it. All right, so some of the cool stuff um, that was out at NAB. Uh, so for those of you that were at the show and actually got to see some of the cool stuff or check out our booth or just have been following what's going on in the uh, uh, filmmaking, broadcasting side of the industry, uh, probably heard about the camera to cloud or the capture to cloud um, kind of push that's been going on right now. So Atomos has released... Um, their recorders, so their captured versions of the uh, recorders, which allows you to do some pretty cool stuff, um, which we will uh, take a look at here. <clears throat> so knowing that a lot of users are using the, uh, uh, currently using things like uh, the Atomos Ninja 5, 5 Plus for, you know, a lot of our cameras, because you want to take advantage of, say, RAW over HDMI, uh, Atomos has now released the Atomos Connect and some of the other cool stuff, so I encourage you to go read up on a lot of this stuff. Um, all about integration into being able to take footage, have proxies made, uh, and then have it sent up into uh, Frame.io so that you can do more collaborative work and have things done a lot easier uh, when it comes to production levels. Or uh, production space, uh, sense is, sense is, man, I can't speak today. Um... So this was one of the cool things that uh, really caught our eye uh, during the show. Uh, so if you're someone who works in a, in a large group, this could be a really cool thing uh, for, for any kind of multimedia uh, collaboration. Uh, I know myself, we are starting to use the, uh, like the Frame.io platform a little bit more uh, when we're doing content creation internally, and I want to be able to get all my feedback there. So... Um, yeah, that, that was a really exciting thing that we saw, um, brings up a lot of cool ideas as to what you can do, uh, knowing that you can have, uh, either a really strong wired or, or 5g or wireless network in a studio and know that you've got your, uh, dailies being run up to, uh, any kind of client that may want to be reviewing this footage and giving you suggestions and stuff. So yeah, there's, there's a lot of really cool stuff with it. So definitely go, go take a look at to, um, the, uh, connected cloud, uh, applications that you're seeing from the, uh, um, Atomos products. Oh man, excuse me. I'm, I'm, I'm really dragging today. Sorry guys. Uh, but yeah, super cool. Uh, aside from that, which was probably, I think, one of the most interesting things that, that I saw and a lot of us have probably, you know, kind of seen from the show, uh, in our booth, we were showing off a lot of the different ways that you can be rigging up and working with Lumix cameras for vastly different use cases. So knowing that NAB is fairly uh, broadcast heavy, you know, uh, PTZ uh, cameras, things like that, uh, we ended up actually showing some pretty cool stuff with um, with our BGH1 and our BS1H, so our box cameras. 
So being able to take the box cameras, which uh, unfortunately, again, I don't have mine here. They are shipping on their way back. Uh, so we're actually broadcasting off uh, my GH6 today. Um, you've got this awesome little package that can be jumping back and forth from a filmmaking tool uh, to a live broadcasting tool where you've got the camera set off in a single place. But if you're anyone that's doing um, installations or doing work where multicam is an important thing for you or... You know, you're used to using pan tilt zoom cameras, so uh, fixed lens, uh, fixed, you know, they have their built in zooms. Um, you have an option now to say that you don't necessarily have to be using those smaller sensors anymore. Companies like Data Video, Telemetrics, uh, they make controllers, so PTZ heads, as well as the actual control boards that allow you to be able to just mount a camera up onto it of pretty much your choice, in our case with the box cameras, because it gives you a lot of extra kind of control with it, uh, and turn one of these cameras into a pan tilt zoom. So we all know that bokeh and the more quote unquote cinematic look is becoming, or it has been, but it's starting to become much more uh, desired in live broadcast you get the ability to take a camera that's either got a four-third sensor, which is infinitely larger than, not infinitely larger, it's much larger uh, than traditional PTZ sensor sizes. Uh, you have the ability to put that on there, use lenses like our 45 to 175 power zoom lens. Uh, you can also, with the Data Videos kit, you can use pretty much any lens you want because of the integration of a Tilted Nucleus M. Uh, that allows you to turn any lens into a powered zoom lens uh, and work with their controllers and have something now that if you're deploying or you've got a camera set up, it doesn't have to permanently be set up as that camera. When the event's done or the job's done, you can pop it off, throw it on a Ronin gimbal or something like that and be able to actually go run and gun and, and capture footage that way with it. So we had a lot of fun showing this stuff off. Um, allowing all of you to be able to actually go up to a controller, play with the cameras, make your zooms, check how the actual parfocal, uh, electronically parfocal nature is of our lenses. Um, so if that's something that you're interested in, definitely take a look at things like the Data Video PTR-10. Uh, this I'm going to drop a link to the PTR-10's uh, website here. Uh, and also go take a look at Photo Joseph's uh, video that he just did on the PTR-10 with the box camera integrations. Um, and you can get a really cool idea of how flexible this system is. And I know a lot of us that join these streams, this may be something that's very specific, might not really be something that's super targeted to what you're kind of creating. Um, but you get a lot of really kind of cool stuff with, with the flexibility that you have in these cameras. All right, let's uh, jump back to some of the, the Q&A uh, questions that we had here. Uh, so an earlier question came in from Jake that said, I want to shoot 48 frames per second for a project, but realize it isn't supported over HDMI for an external recorder. Uh, any chance this could come to future Lumix cameras, if not, uh, with, a if not with a future update? Um, so 48 frames per second over HDMI isn't necessarily something that we disagree with. Um, I'd love to see 48p over HDMI. Um, it's a matter of whether or not 48 frames per second is part of the HDMI standard, which to my understanding, it is not. Um, if it's not part of the standard, uh, it's probably not going to come into it. So it would actually require, uh, an update to the HDMI video standard. Um... Currently, uh, if you're going to be working on a 48p project and that's what you want to be doing, uh, you basically will need to be recording it internally. An external monitor is going to convert it to 24 frames per second uh, so that because it's a standard frame rate for HDMI video transfer. Uh, and by association, that also means that that's uh, tied to the raw uh, data video or d the raw data output as well. Uh, so currently right now, unless the standard changes, uh, my understanding is you won't see 48 frame uh, over HDMI. It's also kind of why you also don't see 48 frame as the uh, raw output uh, or 24 true, uh, true 24 frame uh, as raw data out. So uh, it's a feedback that we take and we get over to our engineers to determine uh, uh, how hard to push and whether or not it's something that the uh, is compatible uh, with the existing standards that are uh, in the market right now. Uh, let's see here. Another question came in from Cl uh, Chris. Uh, 
In the S-Series cameras, what does pixel-to-pixel -pixel actually mean? I get full frame and third Super 35, but not sure what pixel-to-pixel -pixel is. Uh, so this one's actually fairly uh, straightforward. A lot of times I think we overthink some of the uh, namings that's in a lot of these cameras. Um, so pixel-to-pixel, -pixel, all it means is that instead of using, uh, like in the GH6, I'll use as the example. Uh, instead of using 5.7K as the width uh the resolution. So using a 5.7K in 16x9 or 17x9 to downsample your 4K footage, you are using the actual 3840x2160 or 4096x2160 pixels uh, to create that image. Um, so a couple benefits and trade-offs here. Benefit is that you get much longer reach because if you're in, say, full HD and you do pixel-to-pixel, -pixel, you are literally taking the 1920 by 1080 pixels in the middle of the frame and sending them out that way. So that's how you're recording and working with it. Um, I'm going to repeat that because it looks like YouTube froze. So when you're using pixel to pixel, you're actually using the 1920 by 1080 pixels in the middle if you're in full HD. Uh, so your frame is going to crop. So if I were looking at my screen here, it would be a much tighter crop on the actual frame. Uh, the downside in some cases is that you lose the benefit of oversampled footage. So, uh, or, uh, uh, shooting with a higher resolution and downsampling it into that uh, lower res. That's so footage may not be as sharp, noise profiles are gonna be a little bit different when you're using pixel to pixel. Um, but on any camera that has pixel to pixel, it's really just a punch in uh, to use the actual native, quote unquote, resolution of the project or uh, resolution choice you're, you're making. So um, it'll change, the actual crop will change whether or not you're in 4K, Cinema 4K or DCI, uh, Full HD, uh, it, it'll all change. Now, when you shoot something like 5.8K on, say, the GH6, uh, so you're shooting open gate, that's going to be the actual pixel. So that is technically pixel to pixel because you're using the full sensor. You're not over. You're not using a larger area and then downsampling into it. So hopefully that clears it up for you, Chris. A uh, follow-up question from Chris was on your S1 or S5 before you hit record. The focus peaking seems weak. But when I hit record, the screen shows better peaking. Any way to see if uh, see it the same before and during recording? Um, so this is a fairly common thing-ish uh, in mirrorless cameras in, in general. Uh, the standby screen is typically going to be running uh, at a lower quality. Uh, this helps preserve battery life. This also helps preserve um, just in general the, the, the general usability and speed of the camera. Uh, and then when you click record, uh, you're recording and it's using a higher quality uh, playback of it. So that's where in some cases you'll see maybe a change in how the focus peaking looks uh, between recording and then not recording or sitting in standby. Um, I've brought it up to, to our team before to see if there's a way to maybe get them closer. Uh, but at this point, uh, I haven't uh, honestly heard anything back yet, uh, but that was also after a conversation that I had last week, or yeah, early last week, uh, before I've been out of office uh, out at the trade show. So uh, we'll definitely keep following up on it, but um, yeah, so that's kind of why it's doing, uh, why a lot of cameras will do that. So see here, uh, Chris also has another follow-up, says the S1 needs luminant spot meter, program Super 35 to an FN button, and aspect ratio marks like the S5. Um, we will uh, pass that on to the firmware engineers and see if it's something that they can uh, do. So here, Jake says, when shooting to an external recorder, are there consequences in terms of responsiveness or autofocus, manual focus, auto exposure, white balance, S cameras with native lenses? Um, no, there there aren't really any any negatives to it. Um, the biggest thing that 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 you would kind of see between the two ways is just uh, if you are using a simple monitor that doesn't have, say, exposure tools, um, our cameras don't output the waveform. Uh, over HDMI. So for one, if you're using a recorder, you're going to want a clean piece of uh, a clean signal out anyway. So you're going to want to turn all info display off. Uh, and that will allow you to actually be able to 
record a clean signal that's either raw or um, the standard video uh, signal. So you, you have some flexibility there with it. Um, as far as any kind of negatives, you shouldn't see any negatives uh, as far as quality or focus or white balance or anything like that. Um, when it, In terms of image look, uh, depending on how a monitor is calibrated or, you know, how close it may be or may not be calibrated to our rear screen or viewfinder, um, those might be some little differences that you'll see between them. But uh, a lot of times, like if you're looking at, say, uh, Blackmagic uh, Video Assist 12G or a Ninja 5 Plus or Ninja 5, you may see that their um, color profiling of the sensor of their uh, screens may be a little different than the camera. So just something to be a little aware of. Um, but yeah, nothing inherently uh, as a consequence for shooting with them. Um, it's really just down to how you would use the cameras, what would determine whether or not something could be viewed as maybe a negative or a, a, a positive. Yeah. Uh, so let's see here. Uh, Dennis says, wondering if we can see any kind of internal RAW like Nikon did recently, like Tico RAW. Um, we've asked uh, that question to our team. We've gotten that question actually a lot during last week. Um, I just don't have any uh, information, so... See here, Scholarhead, can we have an open gate 4, 4K 422-24P via update on the S1 in the future? It can already do 6K open gate, so I think it can handle that uh, with no Super 35 crop, of course. Um, so <clears throat> the camera can do, uh, the S1H can do 6K open gate 24P unlimited. The S1, if I remember right, can do 6K open gate, but you have time limits, uh, and, if, and they are 420 10-bit. Um, so you're getting an HEVC file. I most, my, my understanding is that 422 10-bit, uh, 6K open gate with no crop, um, so using just a full sensor height and width, uh, is more down to thermally limited and, uh, just general data limited. Um, so I don't think that's something you're going to see as a firmware update come to cameras because you start to look at, uh, reliability of, of the camera. Can it be doing it to the standard that we set it for? So, uh, one in the S1, you'll know that the 6K or 5.9K, if I remember right, it's been a while since I used the S1. Um, you have some time limitations there. In cameras like the S5, you have more time limitations when you're in the 10-bit options. Uh, and a lot of it's because cameras have to be designed thermally to manage uh, those specifications for extended periods of time. That's why the GH6 has a fan in it. Um, it's actively cooled. It's why the S1H is actively cooled. It's why the box cameras are actively cooled. Um, cameras that don't uh, have active cooling, typically you're going to see uh, some more uh, limitations in how long you can record in, a, in any single given clip. Um, that's to protect a couple of things, uh, to protect, protect image quality. The hotter a sensor gets, the hotter the processor gets, the more noise is introduced into an image. Uh, but also in general, just how reliable the system's going to be as it heats up. Uh, so let's see here. Uh, on the GH6 in manual focus, focus assist magnification is, uh, maximum 6x. Is there a way to increase this? Um... I've asked if there's a way to increase it uh, to go, because I know some of our cameras we can do to up to 20 times. Uh, so I'm honestly not sure, um, Strons, uh, but we will definitely ask and see. Um, so for those that don't know, with the GH6, with the new processor and the new, uh, the new uh, sensor, we're able to do manual focus assist while actually recording video. Uh, so that's a big jump up with the new processor and sensor. Uh, from our lineup, uh, but yeah, you get about a, a six times magnification for your manual focus check while you are shooting. So let's see here. Uh, see the video. When I go from dark to sudden spotlight uh, filming speaker, image blown out can help alleviate that. Uh, so most likely that's going to just be down to uh, working on your exposure techniques. Um, there are some simple ways to do it with things like auto ISO or uh, auto aperture. 
Uh, so shooting in things like shutter priority, if you're shooting in full manual, um, you have to be a little more on top of setting um, that setup. Uh, mainly because you are jumping from an exposure set for a shadowy, darker region to a much brighter uh, highlight region. Uh, if you are recording the content, uh, you get a little more flexibility if you're shooting in like log uh, because you can edit it and pull the highlights back. Um, but if it's for things like live broadcast or a live uh, video stream, uh, that's where... At least for me, the way I do it is I set my camera up into app, uh, to shutter priority, have my camera set to 180 degree shutter. Uh, I'll let either my ISO uh, ramp within the range that I select and I'm comfortable with, uh, or I'll let my aperture do the uh, exposure kind of, what's the word? Compensation, I guess, would be the closest way to describe it. Um, and that typically can help. Um, you just want to, typically if you're shooting that way or you're letting something be auto, um, if it's an ISO that you want to let be auto so that you can accommodate uh, major drastic changes in lighting, uh, make sure that you're locking your shutter speed or your shutter angle down um, so that you don't go from having maybe a uh, you know proper shutter angle and motion cadence to going something very staccato because you go very bright and now it has to really crank the shutter speed. That's not really a good look. Um, so yeah, use things like either aperture or ISO to uh, vary the exposure if you're trying to do it that way. Otherwise you would do it manually and you'd have to manually be manning the camera to adjust your iris uh, to compensate for a major uh, change like that. Uh, let's see here. Uh, JKP, will you ever support add support for the S5 for external SSD recording? Uh, actually, I think I did address that one. Yeah, I'm pretty sure I did. Yeah, so that that's a hardware thing. Uh, Ivan says, uh, will there be B-RAW for the Lumix GH6? Um, honestly, I'm not sure. Uh, totally new sensor, totally new processor. A lot of that stuff requires uh, totally new profiling uh, for raw outputs and image quality and anything that you actually want to do with it. Um, biggest example of this is the uh, Adobe Camera Raw support for the stills uh, versus Silky Pix support and others that are starting to come out. Um, when you have a new sensor, it, it takes a lot of testing and evaluation uh, because things aren't as similar as the, you know to previous generations as they are to just being totally new. Um, so I don't know about uh, Blackmagic Raw, but uh, we have asked uh, for it if it's something that can be added to it. Um, and if it can be added to it, I definitely don't have a timeline as to whether or not that's something that can or will be added to the GH6. Uh, let's see here. So we talked about the equivalency thing here. Um, let's go ahead. Will we have... Okay, so that was that answer that I uh, did there. Um... Damien, yeah, uh, yeah, it's a bit of a, a controversial topic. It's just tools. Um, yeah, so the, the the equivalency thing, it's it's such a complicated topic that I would love to be able to address it. It's just a matter of being able to address it from a a point of a point of uh, I guess true like facts and and you know indisputable proof, uh, for the information. Um, I am not a, a, uh, expert on it. I know enough about it, uh, that I know how it works, but explaining it, I would want to have someone who truly understands, uh, equivalency and what it actually means and how in some cases we're using the terminology wrong. Um, that's what can take a lot of time to kind of figure that out. Uh, let's see here. Someone, someone called YouTube. Off-topic question, is the universe infinite? Possibly. Uh, let's see here. Some materials showing increased shadow noise with dynamic range boost mode on. Others show the opposite. I find this uh, mode convoluted. Could you produce a video about it in technical detail? Um, we've actually really uh, been talking about uh, creating a, a kind of a, a video that explains how the dynamic range boost mode works on the GH6. 
Um, because, yeah, it, there are a lot of people that I think have one understanding of what it is uh, and then test it in one way versus others that have a different understanding of it and test it in a different way and then you're getting different results. So uh, it is something that's on the docket for us to uh, work on, get some information together for everybody uh, and try to explain and show how this camera works. Um, what I would say, though, is take a look at... Uh, there's a really good demonstration of the DR Boost functionality and where the benefits are from uh, the YouTuber Potato Jet. Uh, so if you go take a look at, at uh, uh, Potato Jet's review, um, he shows a, a pretty good visual as to what you can expect with DR Boost and where its benefits are, uh, where the dynamic range increase is actually coming in the GH6, which is actually in the highlights. Um, so yeah, definitely go go take a look at that. I don't have the link, so I can't drop it in the chat. But there's a, a, a ton of really good, solid content from uh, very knowledgeable YouTubers out there, um, uh, YouTube reviewers, uh, that can get you some pretty cool info. Uh, let's see here. Cliff, Sean and Matt were working hard out there. Some you know, I some witness to it. <laughs> yes, it was it was very nice me, uh, you know, talking to you again in person, uh, Cliff. I know it's been years. Um, thank you for the kind words, too. Um, yeah, shows are fun. Shows are busy. The more we get to them, the more I hope to get me. Uh, I hope to meet more of you out at these shows. Uh, let's see here. Uh, will they update existing camera? Uh, so yeah, we've, we've addressed the SSD, uh, external recording. Uh, I would like to know exactly what am I using and why this is working this way. There are some weird things going on. Oh, uh, with the DR boost. Yeah. Yeah. So as a follow up. Um, Matt and I will work on seeing if we can get something that, uh, makes it clearer for what, what DR boost is and how it works, uh, for everybody. Uh, let's see here. Uh, bu -bu 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 -bu. Alan, any thoughts on gimbals as remote PT, uh, PTZ heads with the box cameras? Uh, are there any write-ups and models you can recommend, uh, if looking at them as a cheaper option. Uh, yes, actually. So this is one of the other things that uh, I was showing off at the uh, show in our booth is um, a lot of you may be aware, or some of you may not be aware, that in cameras like the BGH-1 and the BS-1H, uh, we have integration with uh, DJI for the RS-2 and the RS-C2 uh, that is utilizing their active track system. So this is an automated tracking system that... Uh, typically, you would need to buy an external accessory uh, to add this functionality to a camera. Uh, but with our cameras, it uses the motion uh, uh, the motion prediction information from our body, face, and eye detection just over the USB cable connected into the gimbal, um, and the camera can do it automatically. Now, uh, there was uh, a couple people I was talking at, uh, talking to at the show uh, that were looking at a very low-cost way to get into something where you have remote camera control. And with the BGH-1 and the BS-1H, they're basically kind of the perfect cameras for it, aside from the fact that, you know, as we talk about with um, box-type cameras, the ability to power over Ethernet, to IP over Ethernet, so you can send an RTSP video feed out. Uh, you can still send a 3G SDI out or even a, f a full uh, that 4K HDMI feed out. Um, but because they can integrate into things like the RS2 and the RSC2, you have a very rudimentary PTZ kind of option available. Um, now, the zoom is the part that gets a little challenging. Um, but if you need a pan tilt option... You could very easily throw it onto one of the Ronin gimbals, the RS2 or RSC2, and use things like your phone uh, to actually control moving the camera, which would act just like a PTZ head or a, a PT head. Um, and then you also have the ability with some of the Ronins uh, to actually also attach a Bluetooth like gaming controller. So you can end up controlling them that way. So if you need something in a pinch, that could be a really cool thing um, that that gets you into some PT options. Uh, they don't have as much of the capabilities uh, for, say, Zoom, uh, because you would need some sort of controller for Zoom. Uh, but if you were using on, say, our BGH-1, uh, the 45 to 175, uh, which is a powered zoom lens for Micro Four Thirds, uh, it's one that's been out for years and years and years. 
Um, you could easily use that lens and something like Lumix Tether. Uh, so now that it's one version, just Lumix Tether 2.0, um, that would allow you to actually control the camera zoom over Ethernet, uh, which is one option. Uh, and then, or you could even use the mobile app uh, to control zoom through. So there are some ways to do it. They're definitely not the most professional way to do it. If you're thinking, you know, coming from a more legitimate uh, PTZ option like the data video or a higher end option like the telemetrics options. Uh, but yeah, there's, there's ways that you can do it, um, Alan. I think that was Alan, right? Yes, Alan. Let's see here. Um, more questions. Uh, Jake says, GH5 uh, has a two times crop factor. Does the GH5S have 1.8 crop factor because GH5S has a larger sensor? Um, yeah, technically. Uh, so the GH5S uses a multi-aspect ratio sensor, which is slightly larger uh, than the traditional uh, four third sensor being used in cameras like the GH5, the GH6. Um, and that's because we can use an oversized sensor by not including a stabilization unit in it. Um, I believe the magnification crop is about 1.8 is what the difference is versus 2.0. So you get a little bit wider of a, uh, field of view out of the GH5S and a BGH1. Um, so yeah, there's, there's a little bit there. Uh, let's see here. Alan, been using a very cheap uh, YT-1000 head with our BGH-1s at some event. Uh, nice. Um, DJ Electric, false colors, when, please, pretty please. Um, you have Matt and my support for false color. Um, we will continue to ask and uh, speak on behalf of everyone out there that wants uh, false color within the cameras. Scholarhead says, uh, why, why I can't use uh, pixel to pixel on your S1 in any resolution? Um, can be a couple of reasons. Uh, one, make sure that the resolution that you're trying to go to is low enough, uh, that it's below the 6K or the 4K, and you should be able to do pixel to pixel. Um, the other thing to double check is uh, if you're in any kind of variable frame rate mode, um, certain things can change whether or not you can do pixel to pixel, depending on how the mode is trying to be read out. So, <clears throat> excuse me, some variable frame rate options, because you need a higher resolution to do it for downsampling. Um, uh, in some cases, that's why a, uh, why it may need it. Um, in, that, in some cases, that's why pixel to pixel might not be showing up on the camera. Um, worst case, if you've checked everything on the, on your particular camera, what I suggest is to save your camera settings out to an SD card, uh, or, uh, CF Express or XQD if you're using it in an S1, uh, do a full camera reset and then go through and see if it's activated. Cause at that point, that's an easy way to tell if, um, one of the settings that, you know, you may have set up for your particular, uh, camera may be blocking, uh, pixel to pixel, um, yeah, and if that fixes it, then you can slowly add your settings back in manually or load your settings up and then try to subtract uh, to see what it is. Let's see here. Uh, tried to update lenses 25 1.4 in the GH6. Can't find an update file on the card. Uh, just a minute before I did the same procedure, updating 100 to 400, and it worked. Can you guys check that, please? Uh, so for one thing, make sure uh, which version of the 25 1.4 you have. Uh, there are two versions. There's the older version, like I have on my GH5 Mark II. That has a silver ring in the front, uh, and it's kind of like a little bit, I want to say like brighter uh, black polycarbonate body. Uh, then there's the new one, which is it has a it's all blacked out. It's the newer newer design language for the lenses and that has the newer uh 240p uh focusing uh, uh cycle rate update uh so make sure you've got the right firmware update file for it um to make sure the other thing to make sure of is that uh, if you're on a mac copy and paste the firmware file onto the root of the sd card make sure there's no other firmware update file on there uh, and then make sure you eject the card um when I go through some processes of like updating a mass amount of my cameras, every once in a while I'll forget to do one of those steps and then I have, it won't be found and I'll have to go back and redo it. So let's see here. Jake says, uh, Whoa, thank you. 
uh, YouTube chat. Uh, bu -bu 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 -bu. Jake says, for videographers trying to decide between auto ISO and shutter priority for exposure, uh, would you lean more towards one or the other? Definitely lean towards ISO. Um, uh, or uh, So let me change this. Uh, definitely lean towards shutter priority um, because the worst, not the worst thing you can do, but the most noticeable thing that can happen uh, if you have the camera, say, in ISO priority, uh, so basically shooting in, say, program, where you're letting your shutter speed change and your aperture, aperture change, um, the worst thing that happens there is that you will, um, your shutter angles will start to go off. So you can start to go really staccato with the footage or it'll end up really, dr usually won't really drag the shutter. Um, and in something like that, it ends up just really not looking great. Um, with auto ISO, I would much prefer a slightly noisier image over an image that is off shutter angle. Um, so that's, that's my two cents with it. Um, so typically I'll shoot uh, shutter priority or angle priority uh, if I have the camera set up as shutter angle. Uh, and then I'll set my ISO to an auto limit uh, and then I'll limit what my uh, higher side of it <clears throat> is, uh, you know, that I'm comfortable to go to. Uh, and, and that'll change depending on the camera that you're using. Uh, let's see here. Keith, uh, when you shoot RAW over HDMI to either the Atomos or Blackmagic devices, uh, could that be extended into open gate and get the full height of the image? Um, we've actually asked about that. Um, Matt and I have asked numerous times uh, whether or not open gate could be added uh, to RAW. My understanding is that Blackmagic RAW and uh, ProRes RAW just don't have any definition for 5.8K or an open gate or a 4x3 uh, in those resolutions. Um, but uh, yeah, it's it's something Matt and I have brought up and asked uh, the engineers to evaluate and check at. So we'll uh, uh, keep keep checking for you. Let's see here. Ulrich, uh, I can set the GH6 to pixel to pixel and still use a 422 codec on a Bayer sensor. There shouldn't be enough color data for that. Is there a calculation over more than four pixels going on? Uh, honestly, that's above my understanding uh, as to how the sensors work. So I wish I could give you an answer, uh, Ulrich, but uh, unfortunately, I, j I just don't have an answer for you. Sorry. I can check in, in on it, though, and um, we can maybe address it in a future uh, stream. Uh, Powell says, if GH6 is able to shoot eight frames mechanical shutter, it, uh, continue autofocus, uh, why is it only able to do seven with electronic shutter CAF? Uh, after it shoots off, after all, it shoots 5.8K CAF. Could you upgrade it with a firmware? Um, so two things are being, uh, conflate or one major thing's being conflated here. One, uh, you're looking at stills burst rates versus video encoding. Uh, stills burst rates are shooting 16-bit container raw files. So they are much more, uh, much larger files, much more information being written, uh, captured and written and processed into the cards. Um, so that's one thing why those numbers typically are not even across the board. Um, the other thing is the difference between a mechanical and electronic shutter. Um, as far as the electronic shutter goes with continuous autofocus versus the mechanical, I honestly don't have an answer for you. Um, it is something that I have wanted to check in with our engineers to see if there's a reason behind it. Um, because typically there are, there's a lot more going on in the imaging pipeline than any of us understand or know, um, or may ever know. Um, but I can check in on it, um, but I can pretty much say for certain that you wouldn't see something like that as a firmware update, um, just because you're looking at a video feed versus stills raw JPEG capture. Um, those files are much, much larger, so, <clears throat> and a lot uh, more in-depth to actually work with. Uh, let's see here. Uh, you're welcome for being here live, Cliff. Um... Again, I apologize for the uh, little bit lower energy today, um, but I didn't want to leave you guys hanging. Uh, I, I love doing these things. I love uh, interacting with everybody and answering uh, y'all's questions that didn't get to come out to the show and talk to us in person. Uh, let's see here. 
Uh, LR says, I noticed that GH6 peaking is not accurate when using anamorphic lenses. Peaking shows up stronger just behind the point of focus. Could a firmware be, fix be uh, on the way for this? Uh, that would be something that would have to be checked into. Um, if there is actually an issue or if it's uh, characteristic of just with those anamorphic lenses. Um, if you let us know some of the information, uh, JR, as to what, what anamorphic lenses you're using, um, I can connect with Matt and, uh, yeah, be able to, uh, uh, you know, maybe get you an answer uh, or maybe identify with our teams uh, something that uh, they should know. So, yeah, um, wish I had a better answer for you right now. Uh, but we will uh, look to see if we can get you an answer. <clears throat> Super Zero, uh, why is it that the GH5S sensor is larger with no IBIS, yet the S5 is also much larger and does have IBIS? Um, so it's uh, image circle. So the uh, circle of coverage that a lens projects onto a sensor. Uh, micro Four Thirds, uh, the mount and a Four Thirds sensor. Uh, were designed uh, at the beginning uh, basically to be used two different ways. Either you could use a slightly oversized sensor uh, if you were not going to be deploying in-camera stabilization to use the maximum area that the lens is projecting onto the sensor. Or you could use a stabilized uh, sensor which uses that additional area to move the sensor around. When you go to full frame cameras like the S5, the S1, S1H, S1R, um, those sensors, they're uh, standard. It's 35 millimeter. And lenses have always been designed to project a little bit larger than 35 millimeter. And that's where your stabilization can occur uh, on the sensor. So that's kind of what you're seeing is the difference there. Uh, the GH5S is just using a larger percentage of the projected image area onto the sensor. Uh, let's see. Where did we go? Uh, ARC, we've ans we've addressed the uh, SSD recording. That's on a GH6, uh, GH6 and forward cameras. Uh, there is hardware that's required for um, external SSD recording that previous cameras don't have. Uh, let's see here. Uh, Redbit, uh, Dennis, actually, uh, with dynamic range boost, you'll need, you'll get a plus of about two stops, even in real life tests, like the one done by slash cam recently. Uh, it doesn't add more noise at the same ISO, but more detail in the shadows. That's why I trust, uh, people that have much higher knowledge in certain areas than I do. Uh, Dennis, thank you for, for, uh, chiming in with that. Uh, Redbit, uh, I need to know if the BS1H can output SDI while uh, externally recording ProRes RAW or ProRes. The goal is to send low latency SDI signal to the focus puller. Uh, yeah, so the um, uh, B BGH1 and the BS1H, uh, your SDI out will be just a video feed coming out. Uh, it's 3G SDI, so it's only going to be 1080. Uh, but yeah, you can 100% send the SDI signal out while you're using RAW over uh, HDMI. Um, in fact, that's basically what you have to do if you want to be able to access the menus, since RAW over HDMI disables menu access over HDMI. So yeah, it, uh, it sounds like it'll do exactly kind of what you need it to. Um, let's see here. <clears throat> Andy says, please tell me if this is something that could be possible, but will the G9 have VLOG for free? It doesn't make sense that Lumix G95, which is a lower model, has VLOG, but the ProCam G9 does not. Um, I don't think there's going to be a change in any of that, um, because the other thing you have to remember is the G9, the VLOG update comes with more than just unlocking VLOG. Um, so it's it's not as simple as just because the G9 has it. The G9, G95 is also only an 8-bit uh, camera with VLOG versus the G9, which can do 10-bit uh, uh, and has some other options available with VLOG. Uh, let's see here. Uh, Frugal Filmmakers. Uh, oh, yeah, it was, it was great talking to you at the show, too. So thanks for swinging by. It was awesome. Uh, please add false color. We're, we're asking for it. <clears throat> Cliff says, what is the next, uh, Panasonic public event and show? Uh, the next shows that we will be at will be Infocom in, uh, Las Vegas again, 
and uh, Cinegear in LA. So we will have, they're both going on pretty much at the same time. So we'll be in two places at once. Uh, so yeah, uh, as we get a little bit closer, we'll start talking more about Cinegear and uh, Infocom. What remains? Uh, let's see here. <clears throat> I noticed recently when using an external monitor for reference, the image was spot on and looked great, but when I got into the edit, the highlights of their faces were blown out. Tips. Um, calibrate your external monitor. Uh, the external monitor might not be calibrated or vice versa. The display that you're working on might not be uh, calibrated. Um, that's typically where that kind of stuff happens. Um, I usually advise at that point, really pay attention to your waveforms uh, using luminance spot meter if the camera has it um, to really make sure that the image is properly exposed and you're not blowing out any highlights or crushing shadows too much. Um, looking at any display is always going to be never perfect. Uh, displays of all ranges could be working at different brightnesses. They could not have the right color accuracy baked into them. Um, and, and, and that will cause problems uh, if, you're do, if you're trying to do it visually. You'll get close, but uh, to your example, you may run into situations where it looks fine on the monitor because the monitor's, you know, say a thousand nit monitor. And the, the edit style that you're working with is only really maybe 300 peak. Uh, or 400 peak brightness uh, for an area. So that, that could cause some issues there. So definitely rely on the tools that we're providing in the camera, like waveform, um, luminance spot meter, to make sure that those areas that you're seeing uh, the files clip in uh, are being properly protected from an exposure level <clears throat> and not just looking correct because the display uh, isn't necessarily, excuse me, uh, because the display isn't necessarily calibrated properly for that brightness. <clears throat> All right, let's see here. Uh, talk about weather resistance uh, or weather sealing on the GH6. So to start with, we do not call it weather sealing. Uh, weather sealing would say that there's an IP rating. Um, the GH6 is weather resistant. So it's to the same level that we are weather, weather resistant on the S1H. Um, if you take a look at Sebastian's video from the launch of the GH6, uh, it gives you a relatively idea, uh, comfortable idea of what um, he is uh, comfortable shooting it with. Uh, we make sure to state like, you know, look, the weather resistance in the cameras, there are never a guarantee that you can't get water into a camera and destroy it. Um, you do want to use some common sense in certain circumstances. Uh, but the camera for going out to shoot, say, in the desert, uh, going out to shoot in a, a vast majority of scenarios, the camera's going to perform great for you. Uh, it is weather resistant to the point that I've never worried about shooting in pretty much any environment um, with it. And that goes for an S1H, that goes for the S5, the, S, uh, the GH5, uh, any camera that, that we've stated. Uh, the important thing to make sure is that you are using lenses that are also weather resistant um so yeah uh let's see here hopefully that answered your uh your uh question uh for that one uh f8 why is gh6 base iso 800 for stills will there ever be an option to manually tune dr boost without trusting the black box algorithms um so base iso is not 800 um that you that's that's something that an independent uh tester uh, it has been um, stating. Uh, I have to do more research in on what um, that particular chart uh, came out with because it seems to be... Uh, I, I have a different experience with the cameras. Um, so, yeah, it's still a little early to tell. Um, but... Yeah, as far as stills goes, DR boost mode's gonna always be automatic and just kind of turn on and turn off when it needs to and when it doesn't need to be run. Um, so yeah, let's see here. Uh, I got time for two more questions and then I'm going to have to uh, call it for today. Let's see here, regarding the peaking, it's Vazen uh, 28.8 and Anisco Ultra Star. Okay. 
Perfect. Thank you, JR. Um, I will connect in with um, my counterpart, Matt and Neil, uh, because we actually have one of those Vazen uh, 28s uh, that we were showing at the uh, trade show. So we can take a look and see um, what's going on there. Martin says, uh, is, there a, is there an issue with uh, playing back videos in camera when using a CF Express to M, M2, M.2 NVMe adapter? The recording works fine. The camera crashes. Can you please fix this firmware update? Probably not, um, because that is not a proper way to be interfacing with a camera. Uh, if you're using uh, CF Express to an M.2 NVMe reader, one, you have the door open on the camera, uh, and we, unless something like that were made by a major manufacturer that's actually part of the standards and testings uh, for those things, you're probably not going to see um, uh, testing be done uh, for things like that. There are way too many... Uh, outside variables uh, that are completely out of the control of any camera company um, and even out of the N uh, the NVMe's uh, manufacturer. Um, so truthfully, if you're shooting this way uh, with a CF Express to NVMe adapter because you're looking to get higher densities at a lower cost, uh, soon we will have the USB SSD recording, which will alleviate that. Um, so right now, I don't foresee there being a uh, anything that we would do firmware-wise to uh, necessarily fix that um, because it would actually be down to that adapter uh, piece. So, yeah, it, it, it's one of those kind of weird areas. We know that people will make adapters for pretty much everything, but at some point, it's just not something that we can, we can uh, test or validate because... Uh, there's just too many variables, uh, too many different uh, uh, hands in the pot for the image pipeline at that point. Uh, let's see here. Uh, hi, Sean. When transferring photos or video clips via sync app, the names in the receiving device, iPhone 12, are horribly long. Any chance to fix that? Uh, that my understanding is that's not down to us. That's down to how iOS uh, stores that image data. Um, so that... My little understanding of that, because I have uh, experienced that, is that it would have to be a change from iPhone or Apple in how they're storing a saved image from an app. Um, it's here. Jake says, I would love to reference a future Lumix Live video for future color grading projects. Just a thought for future streams. Yes, uh, one of the ideas I would love to have is to have uh, someone like Dennis on... Uh, and and talk about LUT creation and color grading and stuff like that, um, or anybody that that is in that uh, category. Um, now that we're done with the first major trade show, I can actually start putting more uh, time behind uh, planning things out a lot further. Um, yeah, uh, and then uh, the last thing that we'll see here is uh, yeah. Um, if you guys want to reach out to to myself uh, outside of these streams and continue conversations, uh, ask more questions, uh, you, I'm available on a number of different platforms. Obviously, we have this weekly stream where uh, I love taking the questions from everybody, but I also am active over on Reddit uh, at Sean at Lumix. I'm over on Facebook, uh, Sean at Lumix as well. Uh, so feel free to reach out. Um, I will do my best to answer uh, as as carefully as I can, uh, and as quickly as I can, uh, I can't always get to questions super quick. Uh, but yeah, uh, check out those different, uh, uh, platforms as well. Uh, you can always reach out to us in the comments down below, uh, after these videos post, uh, to get us some more information, uh, ask us more questions. Um, yeah. So with that, we're gonna, we're gonna call this week's stream. I know it was a little, uh, a little lower energy, but um, thank you all so much for, for tuning in. Um, these things are so much fun, and I love actually having these conversations with everybody. Um, uh, we will be live again next Thursday at 2 p.m. Um, still working out on the topic for that one. Um, most likely, we're going to be continuing the open gate conversation uh, on the GH6, so we'll do some more demonstrations with it. Um, I've also been uh, working with uh, I just got my small rig uh, cage for my GH6, so I'm going to be doing some fun stuff with 4-channel audio on this, uh, rigging up two different ways to be working with it. Uh, so lots of cool stuff coming over the next couple weeks. So 
Uh, hopefully, we've uh, uh, earned a like and a subscribe from you if you haven't already. Uh, it helps me build the channel, and I appreciate everyone that tunes in and uh, asks us questions and, uh, you know, kind of uh, really grills us on some of the things that, 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 that you all want in these cameras. Um, it only helps us make better products, even if I can't get you an answer. Um, know that we read them. Uh, what, what else? Uh, remember about Lumix Pro Services. We have links down in the description uh, where you can check out LPS globally and here in the United States. Uh, if you don't do so already, um, consider going over and checking out our Instagram page. We're Lumix USA over on Instagram, link down in the description. And um, give us a follow over there. Uh, I, if you want to interact with us, you can drop into the direct messages and uh, we'll try to, to interact over there as well. Uh, if you haven't already, uh, make sure to go take a look at the uh, firmware updates that we've been releasing for the cameras and lenses. Uh, get the most out of your equipment. Uh, and as a small little point, just remember that you don't have to update firmware in a uh, sequential manner. So if you have missed a firmware update or two, you can go right to the page, download the firmware update. It includes everything that's been released before it. Um... Yeah, outside of that, thanks again, everybody. Uh, really, really excited to be back to doing these things uh, these things live here at home. Uh, and I look forward to seeing more of you at future trade shows. So, uh, yeah, see you next Thursday, 2 p.m. Eastern time. I uh, hope everyone has a great rest of your weekend. And uh, go out and create some cool stuff and let us see it. It's, it's, it's definitely the thing that keeps a lot of us going and super excited here. So take care, everybody.